here. This is part one, the awesome sound of, tr of seven trumpets. And I think what I'm going to do is bring this down here so that I can look at it. If I put this right there beside you, um, I think if I can just look at it and see it, I think that'll be great right there. All right, keep both of us company. Although I think your idea is better. Let me try this. And the reason is this, I can read the next slide that's coming up. <laughs> I can't read it from there. Okay, the first, the first one is a little bit of a uh, slide, is, um, is a little bit of a disclaimer. It's just simply saying that we're not trying to, because we're going to get into some sensitive stuff, that we believe in religious freedom, we believe in being respectful to everybody, but we are also searching for the truth as it is in Jesus. So that's exactly what um, that is about. Now I want to start with a heavenly sanctuary, and I mentioned this last night, I think just a little bit, but just to uh, familiarize ourselves with it. Uh, the, you see Jesus moving through the heavenly sanctuary, and first of all, he starts at the seven churches, and that's at the candlesticks. He goes from the candlesticks to the seven seals, which is the table of showbread or the throne. Now, it doesn't actually say table of showbread, but I don't have time in this seminar to show you the parallels between uh, chapter uh, 4 and 5 in Ezekiel chapter 1. I wish I had time to do that, but I don't write uh, this one. And then we have, um, then it goes into the holy of holy, the seven trumpets, and we're going to get into that. And then it goes into the Holy of Holies and the final issues of, uh, that face the world. Now let me say this about the seven churches, seven trumpets, and seven seals. This is the repeat and enlarge principle. So they're covering the same time period. They're coming the covering the time period from the time of Jesus' ascension all the way to the second coming. And the sixth church... The sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, transitions us in time from the holy place into the most holy place. The sanctuary is prophetic. The courtyard uh, was prophetic of the ministry of Jesus on the earth. You could see Jesus. But when, he, but when he goes to heaven, you can't see him any longer. Isn't that right? Isn't that true for the priest? The priest goes into the first compartment of the sanctuary. You can't see him any longer. And so then there's two phases in the heavenly sanctuary in time. And that takes us from the time of Christ to uh, the close of the 2300 days. And then the 2300 days to the close of human history. So if you keep that in mind, is that too hard? That's not too hard. You got that. You understand the sanctuary. So we'll just uh, go from there. Now, let's go right to this. And I saw seven angels who stand before God and they had seven trumpets were given to them. Uh, in, in Scripture, you'll find that trumpets are, are blown as an alarm. In other words, they are to tell you that something is about to happen, usually judgment. Uh, here's a text, a parallel text from Joel 2.1. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm for the what? The day of the Lord is coming. So it, it's, it's God's judgment sounds an alarm. Note the parallels between the fall of Jericho and the seven trumpets. I, I think there's a parallel here from Joshua 6, 4, 6, and 20. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho in your hands. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets and take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. Okay, you can see the quick parallel. Seven angels, seven priests, seven trumpets. And then it says that they bore this before the Ark of the Lord. In the sanctuary, where does the Ark, I mean, where does the altar of incense sit. Paul actually in the book of Hebrews includes it into the Holy of Holies. Now we know it wouldn't actually sit in the Holy of Holies, but it had a distinct function, connection between the first compartment and the second compartment. 
And uh, so at any rate, it sits before the ark, directly in front of the ark. There's the curtain and then the ark. Uh, so anyway, I just thought that was kind of a, uh, an interesting parallel. So seven priests blew seven horns for seven days before the Ark of the Covenant. The blowing of these horns announced the coming judgments of God on Jericho. When by the power of God the city walls fell flat, the city was turned into ashes and was not to be rebuilt. Does that sound familiar about the coming judgments as far as this world is concerned? And then the seven trumpets represent uh, God's judgments on the enemies of his church. The church, number five, the church keeps the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus, which are represented in the Ark of the Covenant. Six, when the trumpets finish blowing, the enemies of God's church are destroyed by the power of God and the cities of the nations fell and the earth and all that is in it is burned up. So you, you see this flow that's happening. So I want to say this. The judgments of God are already in the land. There's the final judgment. But the judgments of God are already here. And they're already operating. And uh, this shows that. And if God had not had these trumpets, the uh, Christianity, true Christianity, would have been wiped from the face of the earth. Let's go to chapter 8, verse um, Three to five, another angel came and stood at the altar, that's the altar of incense, in the holy place, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. So the picture here, that as you pray, that these prayers of ours go to heaven, Jesus adds his incense to our prayers. His incense is his perfect, wonderful Righteousness, his own perfect life. And he adds that and makes it acceptable to the Heavenly Father. Aren't you glad for that? And then we notice what happens when those, when those prayers go through Christ as a, our high priestly intercessor. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. The angel took the censer. Notice the reaction now. The angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to where? So your prayers in heaven, our prayers in heaven, have a direct impact on the earth. God answers prayer. So the prayers go up, but the reactions come down on earth. Um, and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder, lightning, and an earthquake. Uh, Babylon has always been uh, the, uh, the great enemy of God's people, and Revelation picks up that uh, theme here. Uh, and the early church understood Rome to be the Babylon. And uh, so the New Testament, the book of Revelation, picks up Babylon. The New Testament also uses Babylon as a code word for, the, for pagan Rome or for Rome. And... Um, I'm just going to go right on past that, because, but that's very important. You'll see in a moment. Rome, in both its pagan and its papal or religious phases, have been proven to be the enemy of God's faithful church for over 2,000 years. Rome, in whatever phase it comes in, pagan or religious, the trumpets announce God's judgments on both phases of Rome. And we'll see that without those judgments, Bible truth would have perished from the earth. Now, the trumpets are divided into two groups. The first four are God's judgments on imperial pagan Rome, if you please. And the last three are God's judgments on apostate Christian Rome. And each is judged by something like itself. I made an interesting discovery uh, a few years ago. I'll share that with you. The first trumpet sounded, and here's the first trumpet, sounded, and there came hail, fire, mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So these are symbols, and I found in my margin, uh, because people say, well, what are these, all these symbols? And I found uh, same symbols being used in the Old Testament against the enemies of Israel. Same symbols. So I want to share... A little bit uh, with that parallel. Here's Ezekiel, and this is God's judgments on apostate Israel. 
One third of you shall die of pestilence and consumed by famine. One third will fall by the sword and I will scatter another third. Go down to the bottom of that. When I execute judgments among you in anger and in fury and in furious rebuke, I, have, I the Lord, have spoken. So what, what, what is the symbolic nature of this third? Because you see this third come all the way through uh, the trumpets here, at least a, a good portion of them. The third says that there is not total destruction. In other words, it's only partial judgment. Um, so that's the meaning there. Now here's another one. Uh, Gog and Magog, those were Ezekiel's code words for Babylon. Notice verse, uh, chapter 38, verse 22. With pestilence and with blood I shall enter into judgment and rain on him and his troops and on many peoples who are with him. A torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Did God actually rain hailstones, fire, and brimstone on ancient Babylon? The answer is no. So what are these symbolic of? They're symbolic of God's destroying ancient Babylon and sending judgments on them. And often that was through the armies of the Medes and Persians, etc. Uh, pagan Rome's cruelty to the early Christian was terrible. Do you think those people, early Christians, cried out to God for relief? Do you think they begged Him when they saw their children being destroyed and eaten by wild animals? Do you, do you think that there were great cries of distress going up to God? Listen, God hears those prayers. He may not answer immediately, but this arouses God's judicial anger, if you please. And so what God begins to do is He begins to destroy the pagan Roman Empire. Imperial Rome is starting to get, it's going to be destroyed. And it's amazing how quick in a sense, that this takes place. Now, everybody knows about how Rome was destroyed. I don't have to get into that. The barbarians out of Europe began to come in. I want to take a look at that. The first trumpet, I think, is a good picture of the city of Rome in 410 A.D. That's 410 years after Christ. The early church has been through a terrible period of persecution. And um, this is what happened there. And, uh, and we'll see something amazing here in a moment. The emperor incited the Romans to riot and killed tens of thousands of Gothic wives, German Gothic wives and children, whose husbands were serving where? In the Roman army. And there was a revenge to that. In revenge, Alaric, a Goth and a Roman officer, gathered the German Goths. First they ravished Eastern Europe, then they invaded Italy from the Alps. And here is this Really, really important thing. How long has the United States been in existence? Since 1776, am I right? So uh, 240, 50 years, something like that in round figures. Um, that's not all that long. But Rome had never been invaded for 800 years. 800 years. What happens next is uh, huge, i put it that way. For the first time in nearly 800 years, the city of Rome was invaded and plundered for three days. And then he moved to southern Italy where he died and was buried with his loot. So you're going to see the succession. Uh, then comes the second angel and something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea. A third of the sea becomes blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. This seems to suggest another attack on imperial Rome from the sea. And that's, have you ever heard of the word vandals, vandalism? Well, this is where this comes from. It's another uh, kind of uh, Germanic tribe from North Africa. And um, the, so the vandals from North Africa were the next attack. And here's the parallel in Jeremiah 51, 24. I will repay Babylon. I am against you, O destroying mountain who destroys the whole earth. I will make you a what? A burned out mountain. Mountain is where people, it was a symbol of where people ruled from in ancient times. And so who were the vandals? Well, they, they were seafaring and they pillaged Rome and uh, and made life miserable. And finally, the Roman Empire 
in Constantinople decided to put together a lot of ships. They put together 1,300 ships in order to destroy the sea power. There's a picture, a reconstruction of what a vandal may have looked like in those days. And so they decided they were going to put a stop to it. There's 1,113 ships. You know how many ships the American Navy has in it? About 250. So this is a big, they weren't warships like our warships, but they're still warships in those days. So this was a, this was a big deal. And they sailed to uh, destroy the Vandals in North Africa. Using a favorable wind, Genseric, that's the Vandal, at night towed many large wooden ships filled with combustibles. And here's from history. In the obscurity of the night, these destructive vessels were impelled against an unguarded, unsuspecting fleet of Romans who were awakened to the sense of their instant danger. Their close and crowded order assisted the progress of the fire, which was communicated with rapid and irresistible violence, and the noise of the wind, the crackling of the flames, the disconsonant cries of the soldiers, the mariners who could neither command nor obey, increased the horror of the nocturnal turmoil while they labored to extract themselves from the fire ships and to save at least a part of the navy, the galleys of Genseric assaulted them with temperate and disciplined valor, and many of the Romans who escaped the fury of the flames were destroyed and taken in by the victorious vandals. That's from Gibbons there. I'm, I'm just moving through here at a fairly rapid rate. The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven and burning like a torch, a third of the rivers and the springs of waters, and the name of the star was Wormwood. Wormwood means poison. So this thing is going to be very poisonous. And many men died from the waters because it was made bitter. And if you go to Isaiah, you'll see a, uh, something that's uh, interesting. Isaiah 14, verses 4 and 12. Take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How are you fallen from heaven, O what? Star of the morning. So the picture, the symbolic picture is there's this star that shoots across here. Uh, it's a pretty good representation of Attila the Hun. Uh, some people say he was the first terrorist that ever lived. Um, and he, he became the terror of, of Rome. This is an unknown uh, conception of him. Usually they try to picture him with horns. You could, if you look at that picture up on your uh, left, you'll see that uh, they have him pictured with horns and pointed ear because it was so terrible. Uh, he'd go to a city. If they didn't go along with him, he'd absolutely kill everybody in the city and turn it into ashes. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, and a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night, uh, Revelation uh, eight twelve. Now notice that in Genesis, the Bible says that God made the great lights, the greater light to govern the day. Notice the word govern, the lesser light to govern the night, and he made the stars also. So the symbolic picture here is that God is about ready to shut down the pagan imperial Roman Empire, at least in the east. And that's exactly what happens here. Adi Acer, he was an Ostrogoth, another dramatic barbarian king, and he assumed power on 476. He took over Rome. He dismissed the Roman emperor, took over power himself. And most historians, the great weight of history says that in 476 AD, 476 is traditionally considered the end of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, what's interesting about this is, uh, and then here's some more references, to, uh, parallel references to Ezekiel 32, 27. But I want, to, I want to go to here. So God's judgments brought down the great iron empire. He turned out its lights. In 410, started it, and then you see the, the uh, dates there that come along. And some of these operate uh, in parallel, so it's not just a clean cut but at the end, in 476, or 66 years later, Rome is finished. It's done. So those are God's judgments on imperial Rome. But there's another Rome that arises, and the next three trumpets are very, very severe. Um, 
Two of the three are related and linked by the symbol of the locust horses. And so the apostasy of religious Rome is challenged by the rise of the Muslims, the rise of the Reformation, the rise of Revelation's remnant, and the rise of atheism. And you're going to see those things come uh, into play here. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Then he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. So there's a prophetic date in there, and we'll come back to that. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold and their faces like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had a breastplate like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings were like the sound of chariots, with many horses running to battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, that's repeated. And they had as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming out of these things. Let's take a look at the data here just a little bit. Uh, first of all, a, fire, a, a star falls from heaven and gets the key to the bottomless pit. Now, that bottomless pit is not a nice place. And uh, I'm going to talk more about that bottomless pit here. He gets the key, and when he unlocks it, this, out of the, this come, the smoke comes out of the bottomless pit and the locusts, like horses, sting like scorpions, come out of it. They have faces like men, but hair like women. They make life miserable for five months and their king is called Apollyon. Most of us know who, the king, who Apollyon is, so I don't have to get into that. Now, let me, again, do a little bit of an analysis here. First of all, Rome comes in two phases. First is Western Imperial Rome. It's been destroyed now by the Germanic tribes of Europe. The second phase is apostate Christian Rome, and that's represented by both the Eastern Byzantine, which we don't talk much about, and we should uh, get it included here. It's represented by Eastern Byzantine Rome and the papacy in Italy. So you have two pieces of Christianity that's taken over the whole Roman Empire. You have the Byzantine. We know them today kind of as the Greek Orthodox or the Orthodox. And then you have Roman Catholic Catholicism with the papacy that took over in Western Rome. Both have the following in common. Both of these uh, branches of Christianity that had, be, uh, had this in common. Both of them combined religion with a state. In other words, religion was used, relig the religion was used uh, by the state to enforce its religious teachings. Or the religion used the state, I'm sorry, to enforce its religious teachings. And both, per uh, both terribly persecuted Bible-believing Christians. There was another line, and you have to really search in history to find them, but there are a lot of faithful early Christians who did not buy into either one of those. We believe that the Waldenses went way back uh, far beyond Waldo, and they really are very, very ancient Christians who preserved the early church and the faith of the early church in the Waldensian Mountains. But they were not the only ones. You have the Abigenses, and you have others in Africa, and so forth. But 
these had joined with the state and they became the prominent religious power uh, in the old Roman uh, Empire. I thought I saw somebody's hand. Yes. I studied that in rural history in school in New York. Yes, yes. It's, it's fairly common history, really. It's so different now. Yeah, it is. Okay, let's go, we'll, go, we'll go ahead. So Western Imperial Rome is punished by and destroyed by the barbarian tribes of Europe. They're destroyed and judged by something like themselves. The religious Rome is punished and, uh, by the rise of a new religious power. And that is the rise of Islam. Ancient Israel had many enemies. How did God punish ancient Israel's enemies? By often confusing them, right? And they duked it out while God's people were preserved. Often that happened. We're going to see something very fascinating happen here as we, as we go. So who is the star from heaven, fall from heaven? Let's let the Bible give the answer. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the day star, son of the morning? And he, Jesus, said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Luke 10, 18. Revelation 12, 9. So the great red dragon, uh, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. And he cast out, was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Satan has always been busy trying to confuse religion. Uh, paganism, and in many forms, is uh, a corruption of the true religion that was given to Adam and Eve in the beginning. And the papacy, I say this kindly, the medieval papacy and Byzantine is a corruption of the faith that was given to the early church and the apostles. Uh, the early apostles, even I, I got online, uh, uh, Catholic online, and they admit when you talk about the Inquisition and you talk about these horrors that were invoked during the medieval times, um, they admit that the apostles would not have done that. That, that. That's an astounding admission. It's an admission that they then did not, even though they claimed they did, they did not inherit the faith of the apostles. Because if they had inherited the faith of the apostles, they would have never invented the Inquisition. Out of, we judge them out of their own mouth, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, and I say that respectfully, but it's the truth. So um, there is a line of, of uh, honest people here. I'm not honest people. Well, honest. They're certainly honest. The early Christian church. Now, let's, let's go on just a little bit and take a look at this bottomless pit. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So Satan is given permission, permission to do something that he's not been given permission to do earlier. There, there's a huge thing going on unseen. There's a huge battle going on. Uh, and we'll see that here. And he opened the bottomless pit. Satan opens the bottomless pit. Smoke arose out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace. What is this abyss, this shaft, this bottomless pit? Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And they, the demons, you know the story, begged him, Jesus, uh, that he would not command them to go into the abyss. This is when the pigs, remember the pigs that ran over 2,000 of them? And the devils, uh, he was casting the devils out of these young men. And the demons begged Jesus not to send them to the abyss, but to allow them to go into the pigs. They'd rather go to the pigs than go to the abyss. The demons don't like the abyss. And uh, then verse, uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness reserved for judgment. So here is a picture where God actually locks up chains, if you please, evil angels 
does not give them freedom to do whatever they want. And they are locked up, reserved for judgment. It's a fascinating picture that we sometimes don't picture. So I'll put it in um, language. Somewhere on this earth, and I know that in the millennium, the earth represents the abyss. I understand that. But somewhere on this earth, God's got a prison. And in that prison are locked up evil angels who are not given free reign to do what they want to do. If they were, we wouldn't be here. I think Ellen White says someplace that if the devil had his way, he'd kill every sign of life, every little bird he'd destroy. So violent and angry are these evil spirits. I saw a hand right here. I, yes, I, we don't know exactly what the chains are, but they are certainly, what, whatever it is, these evil angels don't want to go there. Uh, Revelation 11, verse 7 says, This beast that ascends out of the what? We'll talk about that if we have time a little later. And then Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3 says, Satan is bound there for a thousand years. So he's bound uh, up here. So my point again is they're not given free reign. They're restrained by the power of God. However, our sinful choices give them advantages that they could never have. And uh, that's why you see all the spiritualism coming in. Um, some years ago, they had this huge series on Harry Potter. And when I saw that, I said to Adventist audiences, if you're letting your children look at that, shame on you because this is a plan by the enemy of souls to bring demon possession to little children. Satan wants access uh, to our loyalty. All right. Uh, Revelation 9, verses 2 to 3. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So this is going to be a change on, human, on, on planet Earth. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, locusts can eat their own weight in crops every day. We don't feel a threat from locusts in this country because we have pesticides that we can knock them out. But in some parts of the world, locusts are still a big threat. And you can read about it every once in a while. I read about not long ago in a country where they were trying to get rid of the locusts. Um, these locusts, these symbolic locusts, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority but, uh, to kill them, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion, which strikes a man. I've been stung by bees, but not a scorpion. I don't want to try that either. In those days, men will seek death and desire it, but not find it. Now, the, de de uh, the desert locusts come in two phases. They come in a solitary phase, and they come in the swarming phase. And it's that swarming phase that it becomes a threat to, to human life. And the text goes on to say, they would wish to die, but death will flee them. And the shape of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. So another part of the symbol is not just the locust, the swarming locust, but it's also horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were crowns of something like gold. I think I read this a little early, so for sake of time, I'm going to go on. And there were stings in their tails and power, uh, and power to hurt men for five months. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, here is a picture of the range of desert locusts. And notice where that range is at. You can see it's into Spain. It goes down through here, uh, North Africa. It takes in the Middle East. It takes in Saudi Arabia. It goes over into India, uh, etc. So you can see this is the range. This is a striking relationship. The range of the desert locusts is a striking relationship to the range of Islam. It's very fascinating. Um, and this power rises after the pagan Roman Empire is overthrown. Religious Rome has taken over. And so now God allows this power to start to arise. 
And um, a lot of people don't, uh, and by the way, here's, the, here's a picture of the spread of Islam from seven uh, from, uh, to AD 750. It started about 600, and that gives you an idea of the spread of it. Now, change is going to come, and we're going to want to see that change. Uh, many people don't understand one of the reasons for the Crusades. Among Roman Catholics, it was thought that the pious and notorious act, in other words, you got merit for salvation, was to undertake a journey to some sacred place, especially it was thought that a pilgrimage to the land that had been trod by the feet of the Savior of the world, to the holy city that had witnessed his martyrdom and was particularly pious undertaking, and one which secured for the pilgrim the special favors and blessings of heaven. Now, when the, when the Islam came in, they took over that part of the world and basically... I don't have time to get into it, but basically eliminated, not all at once, but eliminated uh, the Christians and everybody else. The Saracen Caliphs had for four centuries pursued an enlightened policy toward the pilgrims, Christian pilgrims, even encouraging the pilgrimages as a source of revenue. So they owned the place, but they said, we have, you know, it's fine. Send your pilgrims in here. We're glad to have them come in. We're all nice the Roman papacy was not long, uh, however, but in the 11th century, here's the change. The Turks, zealous followers of Islam, wrested from the caliphs almost all of their Asiatic possessions. The Roman papacy was not long in realizing that power had fallen into new hands. 3,000 pilgrims were insulted and persecuted in every way. The churches in Jerusalem were destroyed or turned into stables. If it were a notorious work for pilgrims to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Sepulchre, much more would it be a pious act to rescue the sacred spot from the profane infidels. This was the sentiment that for two centuries or more stirred the Roman Catholic world to its profoundest depths and cast the population of Europe in wave after wave upon Asia. Here are the cause of the Crusades. Uh, we ought to understand the, uh, the Crusades and still a very touchy word. And President Bush, I think the second one, used the word crusade when they were going into the Iraqi war. It just stirred up in Islam a lot of memories, and people reacted to it. Pope Urban II called a great council of the church at uh, Placitia in Italy to consider the appeal, 1095, 1,095 years after the birth of Christ. But nothing was effective. Later in the same year, a new council was convened in France, Pope Urban purposely fixing the place of the meeting among the warm-tempered Marshal Franks, or French, Pope Urban himself was one of the most was one of the uh, chief speakers. He was naturally eloquent, so that the man, the cause, and the occasion all conspired to achieve one of the greatest triumphs of human oratory. Pope Urban pictured the profaning of the places made sacred by the presence of the footsteps of the Son of God. Actually, this is his part of his speech. When Jesus Christ summons you to his defense, exclaimed the eloquent pontiff, let no base affection detain you in your homes. Whoever will abandon his house or his father, or his mother, or his wife, or his children, or his inheritance, for the sake of my name shall be recompensed a hundredfold and possess life eternal. Well, this, the crowd responded, and this is what launched the Crusades. Um, but Jesus would have had an answer to that. And here would have been Jesus' answer. Jesus said to the woman at the well, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in what? For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. This tells us there are no more holy mountains. Uh, when I took a, that trip to Israel, we had a Palestinian guide. Um, he was Christian from ba Bethlehem. But I still remember sitting there on that uh, mount where the Islam has that temple, the Dome of the Rock, which could touch off another world war. 
And I remember sitting there, he was sitting there on some kind of a stone thing. And he looked at us and he says, you know, this place has caused us a lot of trouble. It's caused us a lot of trouble because they didn't pay any attention to what Jesus had said. There are no more holy mountains. Now it's interesting, the history is interesting. But it's not holy. What Jesus wants us to do is to worship Him in spirit and truth, to be a blessing to the world. Uh, if you never travel there, you're not miss much. Uh, it's interesting from a historical standpoint, but not from a salvation standpoint. So the Muslim Turks take power from the Muslim Arabs, and they begin imposing harsh treatment on Catholic pilgrims in response the Pope calls for the Crusades in 1096. Edward Gibbons calls the Crusades savage fanaticism. Uh, I don't have time to go into all the Crusades, uh, except I will tell you that on the way, the Crusades were not only aimed at Muslims and Islam, they were also aimed at Jews. And they were also aimed, of course, any heretics that might get in their way. But they actually destroyed a whole community of Jewish people, men, women, and children, slaughtered them on the way. It is Rome, and I say this clearly, kindly, it's the Roman papacy that taught Europe to hate Jews. Um, the last crusade was what I, I, it's unbelievable. It's called the Children's Crusade. And there were some children, 14, 15, one of them's Stephen, his name was Stephen. Uh, anyway, he said, Oh, the adults couldn't do it, so we can do it. And they began to gather tens of thousands of children, parents screaming and pleading with their children not to go. But there's a evil spirit with this and they were being helped by some of the religious leaders and they took these children and they, they said well how are you going to get across you know the uh, uh, sea there to oh it'll open like the Red Sea for us and we'll be able to conquer the Holy Land again and we'll have it back well the sea didn't open and some boats showed up purporting to carry them to the Holy Land and tens of thousands of children we know today were sold into slavery. And uh, that was the last of the Crusades. As I said, this is judgment on religious Rome. And let me go to um, the, the fifth trumpet. We're still looking at the fifth trumpet. This is July 27, 1299. Now this date is important because it really starts the start of the five months. And there's another prophecy and they're all put together. And this is where, this is where some of the attack has been. People have made fun of and laughed at and said, you Adventists, and you'll see why it's important to Adventists before I'm done here. And you Adventists don't know what you're talking about. That's not when it, that's not the date. But let me tell you, we know today that, that date is a very powerful date. And uh, and we've got recent evidence, recent uh, scholarly work that's uh, helped us to understand that. July 27, 1299, Islam strikes like a scorpion. The Ottoman Empire, the Turks, invade for the first time Eastern or Byzantine Rome. And they start putting pressure on, the, on uh, religious Rome. So this is a prophecy of five months. Um, I, I don't get into the 1260 year part because I think many of you are very familiar with that. So I'm just going to go down to the prophetic month. The prophetic month is 30 days. Five times 30 equals 150 days or 150 prophetic years. So for 150 years, this, the Turkish power was going to um, make a difference. So the question is, where do we find a movement against religious Rome that comes after pagan Rome that fits this description. This is a very good description of the rise of the Ottoman Empire, which has still an effect on us today. We'll talk about that when we get into it, which attacks religious Rome 
in two phases. The scorpion and the snake phase. We're looking at the scorpion phase right now. When did the Ottoman Empire begin? How can we know that the date, how do we know that the date we can determine the beginning of that five months? Now this gets a little technical and I, uh, I'm not apologizing for that because I, I want to make sure that the next time you hear all these attacks on this thing, you, you can understand it. Am I losing any of you still with me? Okay, if I'm losing somebody, raise your hand and let me know and I'll try to back up. All right. Um, so we got the Ottoman Empire, the Turks now, and they've come on the scene. They're putting pressure now, invading um, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, anybody ever been to Constantinople? I've only flown into the airport once, but Constantinople, uh, if, you watch, if you watch the news, two parts of NATO, now that's up to date, isn't it, NATO? Two parts of NATO is Greece and Turkey. And NATO is always worried about those two because they hate each other. And they will go to war with each other over the drop of a hat. And the reason they'll go to war with each other is over Constantinople. Because Constantinople was the Eastern Roman Empire. It was the seat of Byzantine Christianity. So the Ottoman Empire, also known as the Turkish Empire, Ottoman Turkey, or simply Turkey, was founded in 1299 by the Turks under Osman I in northwestern Anatolia. That's another name for Asia Minor or Turkey today. And that's Encyclopedia Britannica. The date that historian Gibbons gives is July 27, 1299 for that attack on the battle of, uh, I don't if I always say this, but it's uh, Bafias between Osman I and the Byzantine Emperor in what today is Northwest Turkey. In more recent times, part of that date has been challenged. July 27 is not challenged, but the 1299, and most often replaced with the year 1302 and 1301. Now I'm sharing this because the Seventh-day Adventists, we need to know, we need to know the truth as it is in Jesus. And you're going to find that under the sixth trumpet, you're going to find the prophetic rise of the Adventist movement. And that prophetic rise is tied to some dates. And if this date is wrong, then the dates of the prophetic movement are wrong. And that's where our enemies, both outside the church and, bless their hearts, some inside the church, have attacked and said, you can't really call yourself a prophetic movement because these dates don't work. So that's why it's important to understand some of this. So uh, Gibbons, is a, he wrote, I've got him in my library, three volumes on the history of the Roman Empire. And he's one of the best historians you have. He's a great historian. No historian is absolutely perfect. But the date that Givens gives is July 27, 1299. Now, what, what happened? Why is this uh, date so important? I've explained that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Now, let me talk about another historian that is, that is a witness to those times. In other words, this historian lived in and around the time when the Ottoman Empire attacked Byzantine Empire for the first time. Still with me? Yes. All right, wave your hand if I'm losing you somewhere. Uh, and his name, and I'm not sure I can say his name very well either, but his name is George uh, Pactamirs, 1242 to 1310. And he was a Byzantine philosopher, teacher, learned in many fields, and a leading historian of the time and scholar of his time. Now he too uses the, uh, the July... 27, but he never gives us the year date. So there's a French historian that is accepted now by modern historians who examined the writings of Pactumir and, uh, and he came up and he says, no, it wasn't 1299, 
It was 1301 and 1302. Or 1302. But um, there have been some um, studies of that now, and it's very fascinating what's happening. This is Dr. Alberto Treyer, his PhD, and he comments on this date. Uh, the Ottoman Empire invades Eastern Rome on July 27, 1299. It is evident that Pactomirs goes back to the year 1299, the date of the beginning of Book 10, to tell the story of that battle. As Gibbons understood it time ago, the date July 27, 1299 fits better with all the earlier Ottoman sources which make prominent the year 1299 for the beginning of the Ottoman Empire with the adoption of Sogut and the capital of the new empire and his first significant advances towards the land of the unbelievers. Now let me add to that. It is Western historians that have backed away from the year 1299. But it's the Eastern historians, the Islam historians, hold to the date 1299. In fact, if you get on the internet and you, find, you want to find the date when Turkey was established, when the Ottoman Empire was established, the date they give you, July 27, 1299. We think today that that date is very sound date. And, and uh, it gets pretty technical and I don't have time to get into all of that. But even one of the French historians that Dr. Alberto Treyer wrote and showed him how he was analyzing his material and that the analyzation showed that his date was wrong. The guy wrote back to him and said, I think you've got something very interesting here. Now put that in my words. But we think we can substantiate quite well this July 27 date for the start of the Ottoman Empire. So Taking that date as the start of the 150 years, that's going to bring us down to the year 1449, 150 years later. In 1449, the Ottoman Empire controlled Christian Eastern Rome. Now, this is going to be a very important point when we get down to the end of this time prophecy. In 1449, the Ottoman Empire controlled the Christian Eastern or Byzantine Rome with the Christian emperor when the Christian emperor would not take the throne without permission of the Muslim sultan. Now this just shows you the progress. For 150 years, the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Muslims, could not conquer Byzantine Rome. But they, have, they made life miserable, and you can read about it. Didn't, didn't knock the empire down. But when you get down to 12... Uh, to, uh, to 1449, 150 years later, they have so weakened the Byzantine Empire that the Christian emperor of the Byzantine Empire would not take his throne unless he had permission from the Turkish Muslim sultan or emperor. So now you have the Christian powers falling underneath the powers of Islam. And now a different phase begins to start. And we want to... Uh, you still with me? Now I want you to remember that. That this, these Christian powers now have fell underneath the Ottoman Empire. That'll be important as we get down the road here. Uh, this is uh, 1448 A.D. Constant, uh, it just gives you the... He was not crowned until 1449. I'm not, I don't have time to get into all of that right now, but let's go to here. The power of Islam is going to change in the next trumpet. It will change from the sting of a scorpion to the, uh, to the deadly bite of a snake. And I think, I'm looking at my media people, I need to have you change my one to part two. All right, very good. 
Thank you. You guys are really right on it. It's terrific. All right. Let's go to part two. And I'm, this is some review here, and I'm not going to go through the review because I usually do this in about three-part series, and you have to review a little bit in order to uh, get uh, down here. Oh, there, there's an interesting uh, picture. Um, see that? And I found this in a library, a public library, but it's a Muslim shooting over the rear of a horse. By the way, who are the great horsemen of uh, civilization? Who are the people that brought horses to us? What, what's the most famous horse, kind of horse? Arabian, Arabian horses. Uh, so these guys were, uh, and they, were, they would ride these horses into battle, and um, their, their enemies would see them coming, and then they would turn their horses and look like they were fleeing, and when they did, their enemies put down their shell, uh, their, their shields, and they come right back over the rear of the horse and uh, I let loose a barrage of devastation. Um, okay, so it's going to change. The power of Islam is going to change the body of a snake. Okay, the sixth angel, the sixth trumpet sounds. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before the Lord, before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared, and here's the other time prophecy, and you can add this to the 150 year had been prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year, and were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, some of the critics will say, that's not a time prophecy. That's only talking about one point in time. Punctiliar is what they call it. And uh, we went to uh, uh, a Greek, uh, not a Greek, but a Hebrew expert, I'm sorry, Greek expert on this very kind of a thing. Um, and uh, I think he's with Hebrew University, uh, and I know him well. We went to him, and we asked him, look, just tell us the truth. Is this just a one point in time, or can this be a span of time? He says it can be either way. So I believe that this is a span of time, of course, it ends at one point down here. It ends at one point, and, uh, and then you, you hear it here. So for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, and they're released to kill, and you, here we go. So and continuing on with the trumpet number six. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. Now, I've also found this picture in, the, in, a, in a library, and look at the colors of these Muslim soldiers. These colors of these Muslim soldiers actually match exactly what the Bible described in colors. Now, there's a, cha a change now. It doesn't sting like a scorpion. It has a bite like a snake, but these horses actually... In vision, he sees this symbolic, uh, actually belch, uh, brimstone, and fire. That's a fascinating picture there. And I want to talk about that for a moment. Constantinople was the great prize that the Ottoman Empire wanted. Because Constantinople sits on the control. You can control Asia and you can control Europe in those days from Constantinople. Uh, it, and you can control the north. It had the entryway from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. It was an incredible strategic spot. The Byzantines had so, and the Greeks had so um, fortified Constantinople that no one had been able to conquer it. They had a, we don't even know what the formula is today. They had a thing called Greek fire, and they would unleash this uh, out on the um, uh, causeway, the river, that are the connection between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. They'd unleash this, and their enemies uh, couldn't stand up against it. The walls seemed like they were absolutely impregnable. But now there's a change, because a thing called gunpowder has been invented. And, uh, and the Turks were quick to make use of gunpowder. 
So what they did is they had big brass cannons and they melted those cannons down because they couldn't haul them over the terrain in one piece. They melted these cannons down and then when they got to the walls of Constantinople, they melted them down again and recast them, used gunpowder and blew down the walls of Constantinople. This thing now stings or bites like a snake. Constantinople falls and the Byzantine Empire is done. You'll see something else that's going on though with this. You say, well, what about the papacy in the West? Well, I'll talk about that a little later here. But uh, this is a very powerful uh, picture. So by... uh, um, and, and this just reiterates the brimstone, and I'm just for sake of time, I'm going to move along here. But this is a very important part right here. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues or these trumpets did not repent of their hand, the works of their hands. Notice this. The issue here is repentance. God is sending these judgments on religious Christian Rome because of apostasy. And because they are persecuting Bible-believing Christians. They did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship demons. By the way, the New Testament connects demon worship with idol worship. They should not worship demons, the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Uh, By the way, it's not just... Catholicism that uses idols in its worship. The Byzantines don't like you to say this and they would be very unhappy with me for saying this. And they don't have, they don't have a molded images in their church, but they have pictures and they call them icons. And their people still go in and bow to those icons and kiss those icons. And yet they say, but we're not worshiping them. But the Bible forbids the use of those kinds of things in worship. And it's very offensive to God. And these powers are doing that. And the Bible's very specific right here in Revelation saying this is why God sent these judgments on these folk. All right, let me just uh, go on here. So in 1449, at the end of the first 150 year prophecy, the new Byzantine emperor takes the throne with the Muslim permission. But just a few years later, in 1453, the Ottoman Empire strikes like a snake and Constantinople falls with the invention of gunpowder. All right, let's take a look at that time prophecy again. You still with me? This is fascinating stuff. And it's getting closer to home, and it's going to get very close to home before we're all done here. So... uh, the first 150 years, starting July 27, ends in 1449. And then you have this prophecy. You can see the outwork of that, the one hour, the one day, the one month, the one year. All that adds up to 391 years and 15 days. So, and that will end on August 11, 1840. That's getting very close to the year 1844. So what do we see going on here? Now, I I like history and I like timelines and I just uh, want you to take a look at this and we're going to build this list. If you can go back to those dates there. See 1299, it's about 1300, about 1300 AD, 1299, and then we get down to 1840. So think about that between here and there. Now, notice these dates and what's happening. 1377. Who is John Wycliffe? He's the morning star of the Reformation. Europe is in the dark ages where life was brutal, short and short and nasty. That's the way one historian describes it. You wouldn't want to trade places with them. Look at uh, early 1400s. You have the rise of who? Huss and Jerome. The Muslims are putting pressure now on Europe. And 1449, the uh, already going to the Byzantine Christian emperor takes the throne with the Muslim permission. 
1453, Islam strikes like a snake. Here is, uh, you can see that in this early part, um, we, we, find, we find a parallel thing going on. You find the, the, the apostate Christian powers coming under pressure from Islam. And at the same time, you start finding the morning stars of the Reformation. John Wycliffe, Huss, and Jerome. And I won't take time to go into that for uh, sake of time. But I want to come down to a little bit more dates here. Uh, then look at 1453, Islam strikes like a snake. And 1492, what happens? America's discovered. We all know the little thing, you know. Uh, 1492, sound the ocean blue or whatever. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. So... This is all important. What we are seeing here is the setting for the final picture of the time of the end and the Reformation and everything that's going to play in Bible prophecy here. Um, now, in this, then the scene changes. The scene changes. And he says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like the pillars of fire. So while all this Islam pressure is on Europe, and while you have the morning stars of the Reformation coming up, then after that you see this picture of this mighty angel who comes down, one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea, and he is a glorious being. So we might ask ourselves, who is this being that comes into play? I believe this angel represents the Protestant Reformation. It is the Protestant Reformation that has changed human history and has affected everybody in this room today. Without the Protestant Reformation, there would be no United States of America. It wouldn't, it wouldn't exist and so I think this mighty angel is the Protestant Reformation that comes down. But this, refer, this Reformation started in 1517. Not, not 1492. Not, but it's not long after 1492. So 1492, Columbus sells the ocean blue. America is discovered. It's not set up yet. But not too many years after that, you have the rise of the Protestant Reformation. So what is God doing? He's getting a place ready to receive the Protestant Reformation. The earth is getting ready. The Lord is preparing the earth to get ready so that this Protestant Reformation, and I'll talk more about how we fit into that, is going to see God's work finished in the earth. So let's take, if we take a look at that, again, there is Martin Luther. You can see all those dates again. See, there's John Wycliffe. And if you go back to 1300, 1299 with the Ottoman, and then you just see those dates flow right down there, and, and then here's Martin Luther. So something powerful is really happening here. And I'm not, I don't want to take time to get into Martin Luther. I could do that, but I'm not going to do that uh, right now. Except I will say this. The Protestant Reformation only had a huge impact as far as America is concerned, but the great contribution of the Protestant Reformation was to translate the Bible into the common tongue. And not only has English been uh, pulled together because of the King James Version, but the German language was also pulled together and standardized because of the translation of the Bible into the common uh, tongue. Um, and this, this is worth watching time here. We've got a few more minutes. This, now, this, this is uh, Dumenet on the history of the Protestant Reformation. Now, this protest opposes two abuses of man in matters of faith. The first is the intrusion of the civil magistrates, and the second, the arbitrary authority of the church. Instead of these abuses, Protestantism sets the power of conscience above the magistrate and the authority of the Word of God above the visible church. But it goes further. It lays down the principle that all human teaching should be subordinate to the oracles of God. 
The protesters had moreover affirmed their right to utter freely their convictions of truth. They would not only believe and obey, but teach what the word of God presents. And they denied the right of priest or magistrates to interfere. The protest of spires was a solemn witness against what religious against religious intolerance and the assertion of the right of all men to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. I want to stop and say this, and we're going to see that in just a minute. The Protestant Reformation is at a critical point. The protest of the princes, I'm not going to take time with the history. Before Charles V takes place, I've been to Spires, I've been in that cathedral, I've seen that huge crown where the Pope would crown all the prelates, of, or not prelates, but the kings of Europe and so forth. But they stood there and they made this protest. And that's where the word Protestantism comes from. And that's why we have today the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States is not a Roman Catholic doc document. It's a Protestant document. But Charles V vowed, and he told those princes that he would come back, he would bring his armies, and he would devastate Germany, he would devastate their provinces, and he would slaughter them. He meant it. Every word. He meant it. But there was a problem, and it was called Islam. Mm -hmm.